Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 370, headphone maven and editor-in-chief of innerfidelity.com, Tile Hertzens, answers questions from the chat room. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded September 1st for September 7th, 2017. Episode 370 Headphone QA. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of AVSForum.com. This week's guest geek is Tyle Hertzens, headphone maven and editor-in-chief at innerfidelity.com and one of Home Theater Geek's most popular guests. Hey, Tyle, welcome back to the show. Hi, Scott. It's good to see you again, of course. I always uh, love hanging out with you guys and the whole Twitterverse there, scrolling their questions and comments up the screen. So, hi, guys. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. And today is all about the chat room, actually. We're going to be answering questions about headphones from the chat room. So uh, please get those uh, queued up for us. And uh, if it always helps if you put my screen name, which is Scott Wilkinson, my name without any dots or dashes or spaces, anywhere in the message. That way it shows up in a different color on my screen and I will see it more easily. Now, while we're waiting for, uh, for some people to queue up some questions. Um, I just wanted to ask you uh, what what's up lately in headphones? Which models have you been looking at? Which ones have been particularly impressive? Um, what's what's the latest in the world of headphones? Well, since last uh, we talked, I reviewed the Mr. Speaker's Aeon headphone. This is about a six $700 sealed planar magnetic headphone. And boy, is it good. I, I think yeah. it's better than his other higher cost planar magnetic offerings uh, in the sealed universe. It's really, really a fine headphone. Wow, uh, it's fu so funny it because just before the show started, uh, we were talking with Padre, who's a host of a couple of shows there on on Twit. And uh, he asked me specifically about that he had heard some planar, planar magnetic headphones at CES from Hi-Fi Man, and he was totally blown away. Uh, yeah. But then he heard the price, and he went, "Oh, well, never mind." <laughs> yeah, it was like but you're saying here, here are some that are more affordable, right? I think the 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 headphones he was talking about were, were the uh, uh, Hi-Fi Man's new top of the line version. I think they were going for six thousand dollars. So this is one tenth that price. So that's mm -hmm. uh, a relief for sure. Yep, exactly. Uh, anything in the uh Earbud category, or I shouldn't. I should say in ear monitor. Uh, I, in ear I think, monitor. Yeah, is it true <laughs> that earbud is kind of not really to be used in in uh, serious headphone circles? Well, earbud is is a very specific type of headphone, and and mm -hmm. you, so you can use the term if you're meaning to talk about earbuds. In in the uh, uh, specification, the IEC spec, they're called intraconchal headphones which means they fit in the the bowl of your ear so mm -hmm. uh they're a little different in that in that way rather than sealing in your ear canal which is they call an insert earphone so they, mm -hmm. they use different terminology altogether um uh, as a class earbud headphones the ones that don't seal in your ear canals uh uh, is the worst type of headphone because you just can't get any bass response. It's just not able to compress the air around it enough and it leaks all over the place. So they're, they're a pretty horrible headphone as a class. And astonishingly enough, uh, uh, and, and they've leveraged this to the hilt now, uh, Apple really does make the pretty much the best one. There's one other uh I'm not even sure I can remember the name because it's been so long since I looked it up. But uh, uh, Apple really makes a great earbud for earbuds. <laughs> it's still terrible sounding, but, but it, <laughs> less it's, terrible it's good. than other options. Right. So. <laughs> but that's right. Less horrible. I, I should do my reviews like this. Well, this is a less horrible headphone than this. <laughs> uh, are you talking about the wireless one? What are they called? The AirPods or AirBuds the AirPods. or something? Right, the AirPods. Uh, 
Well, um, they first came out with a wired version of that air the the ear pods. They they yeah. switched from a, a no, kind of a normal looking earbud to those. They're still earbuds, um, and yes, now they have the AirPod. I I haven't I haven't played around with one yet, but um, ah okay, it's an interesting concept. But I I tend not to do reviews of earbuds and even in ear headphones simply because. I've got my hands full with full size and on ear headphones. So mm, I, mm. I've just been focusing on that. It's, it's, you know, how many pairs of headphones are out there, Scott? What do you think? <laughs> uh, I don't know, 5,000? Oh, probably more than that, I would say. Probably 10,000, maybe. Yeah, I know. It, it just so many people make headphones. So it's it's yeah. hard to keep up. And and I do try to spread myself out a little bit and, and uh, find good low cost headphones. Uh, I, I did just recently do a low cost headphone. I, I'd have to pull it up to remember which one it is. Oh, the Sennheiser Sennheiser uh -huh. HD 471. It's a full size sealed, uh, headphone and it, it's it for, you know, uh, 60 bucks, 69 bucks. It's terrific. Wow. So it, it, Under a hundred yeah. bucks. Yeah, and and so if any of uh, your folks out there are you know aspiring uh, media producers and stuff like that, it's a great headphone. It's a very truthful headphone. It's lacking a little bit of bass, and it's a, and it's a little more rolled off on the on the top end. But the mid range is nice and coherent. I mean, it's just for sixty bucks. It's it's a great uh, little headphone. So the Sennheiser wow. HD. What? 471 HD, HD 471. Okay. From Sennheiser, Sennheiser HD yeah. 471. Uh, yeah. Good recommendation. I appreciate that. Okay. We got a few questions here, so we'll get right into them. JJ to the 4884. And I'm assuming that little arrow is what that is in the screen screen name. Uh, what about dual driver options? He's currently using a one by one, using one by one earbuds with dual drivers. And it has a quote unquote, better sound stage to him. Although he says he's not an audiophile. What do you think about dual driver headphones, which I guess means two drivers in each ear? Yeah, I'm going to assume that he's talking about an in-ear. He's, he's uh, uh, talking about an in-ear there. Um, mm -hmm. Headphone, yeah. So in-ear headphones with balanced armature drivers, balanced armature receivers, if you want to get technically correct about it. And these are very small, very special type of uh, acoustic drivers. Um so balanced armature drivers can't uh, really do the full spectral range. And so uh, with in-ear headphones, you do get multiple drivers uh, and some up to 10 or 12, I think yeah, somebody has. Oh, my uh, goodness. In -ear. Yeah, it's just crazy sometimes. Well, yeah. they, in fact, well, he, they, in fact, he asks about about multi driver headphones and earbuds as well. So not just two. Right. Uh, so for in ears, it's a legitimate approach, especially when you're talking about balanced armature drivers, um, because you have to cover a lot of territory, and a lot of people do multiple drivers with balanced armature headphones. Um, it there is beginning to be more people who do a hybrid where they have a dynamic driver for the low frequency response range of the in ear, and then they have a balanced armor armature for the high frequency response range. My take. Uh, generally speaking, is that it's not an easy thing to do, and not very many people manage to really get it right. Um, mm. I would say of the yeah, in ear he headphones, um, Ultimate Ears and Jerry Harvey are uh, are the two people, JH Audio and Ultimate Ears, who probably get the get it closest. But it's still the the response still tends to wobble around. Some um, also some of the noble stuff is good it, it, for a generic tip. Um, those Jerry Harvey and and uh, 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 Ultimate Ears are are uh, uh, custom in ears, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. but Noble makes a couple of uh, 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 universal fit in ears that are quite mm -hmm. good, multiple drivers. But you can go horribly awry uh, with it as well. Uh, some people really can't figure out how to do it very well. And the other thing that happens <clears throat> evidently is that there's this issue of time alignment. Now, it, it, there's not very much time difference in these drivers because there's not very much distance there, but there is some. And uh, Jerry Harvey does some special stuff to align the phase in his drivers that other people 
don't do. He's he's got some sort of secret sauce in there. And I think he's on to something. I, I, I don't necessarily agree all the time with his response uh, in, in terms of the overall tonal response, but um, he, he seems to get this time alignment down really good. The other thing to be wa- uh, careful of with uh, in-ear uh, multiple driver balanced armature driver headphones is the impedance swings very heavily uh, with these um, – types of drivers as the, it goes through the frequency response range. And so if the amplifier that you're using to drive them has a fairly high output impedance and the headphone impedance is relatively low, say 10 or 15 ohms or 20 ohms, um, then you can get a lot of interaction between the impedance curve and the frequency response through the high output impedance of the amplifier. So mm. I, I would recommend if, if somebody sink a lot of money into uh, custom in-ears that they really make sure they get a separate amplifier that's got a very low output impedance. Make sure it's below uh, – make sure it's below 2 ohms and ideally below 1 ohm. Um, mm. And then – if you're if you're uh, if you're getting a, a less expensive one, you really don't want to use an amplifier. Just make sure the impedance is kind of up above forty ohms. Uh, you're talking about the headphone impedance there. Yeah, the headphone impedance. Make sure it's up above mm-hmm. about forty ohms, so it doesn't interact as much. I mean, it's better higher, but the the problem is everybody is making these headphones with low impedances. At any rate, I've Why seen quite that? a few. Uh, because then you can drive them uh, better from portable handheld devices. Uh, of course, of course. Okay. Uh, give us a quick rundown of what balanced armature is as opposed to dynamic driver. You, you, you've used those terms, and I'd like to make sure everybody understands roughly what they mean. Uh, well, uh, that's really tricky because it's kind of hard to describe what a balanced armature driver is because it's a very <laughs> weird thing. But it's basically... It's basically like a little diving board, and it has a coil on it, just like a a, 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 a voice coil on a headphone, except it's very small. And uh, and that coil is around a little metal slug that pushes this diving board up and down. Mm-hmm. And on the other end of the diving board, it goes up to a diaphragm. So one end of the diving board is driven by this coil, and this other end is driving a, a, a diaphragm of some sort of some sort. A lot of times that diaphragm is also a diving board with an elastic membrane around it. It, mm. it gets pretty complicated. A lot pretty of times weird. Yeah, a lot of times they'll do things like put a drop of ferrofluid in there underneath the diving board to damp it. Um, mm. So there's these really odd things that they do with it. But the, but the thing that's really weird about balanced armature uh, receivers is the right word – is that they've been around – this type of device has been around a long time because it's very efficient – turns out mm. uh and it was one of the f- first speaker types actually made back in the telegraph days to to produce the clicky uh because really? it's kind of like that yeah to produce the clicky sound um so the the thing about balanced armature drivers is they're very efficient but they're efficient because they have this high cue in their response and that's why they're really hard to design with and really hard to get wide bandwidths out of. And so mm. it's, it, it, there's a lot of black magic that goes on in the balanced armature driver world. And, <laughs> and a dynamic driver is basically the same as any speaker. You got a little right. cone, you got a little voice coil, it vibrates right. in a, and it's kind of sort of a more normal driver that we would think about. Uh, Except I, I will I, I will just make this one comment that um, compared to a speaker driver, a headphone driver is usually attached and fixed around its surround, while mm-hmm. a speaker surround has a surround that moves in and out to try to keep the cone stiff. So most headphone drivers, um, you have these two plastic parts on the side and then a dome in the middle, and it's this movement in the middle that's going up and down, but at the edges it's it's attached. So it's a little bit. Different in most headphones. There are headphones, uh, microfiber diaphragm headphones that that act just that look just like speakers. Mm-hmm. Um, Focal has a new headphone that is a uh, essentially the whole thing is a dome, pretty much. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so it's like a speaker, and it has a surround as well. Um, Sennheiser makes a toroidal driver that um, so that so the two edges go up and down like this but mm. so there's a few odd types of drivers and i should say there's a couple of full-size headphones that have multiple drivers in them mm-hmm. um 
Uh, one is by an Enigma Acoustics, uh, has one that has a piezoelectric, uh, uh, well, it's essentially a, a, uh, an electrostatic, uh, permanently charged electrostatic uh, driver for high frequencies and then a, a, a traditional dynamic driver for the low frequencies. But there's mm. even one that has a, a, a normal dynamic driver for the low frequencies and a balanced armature the receiver in there for the higher frequencies huh. and it just projects, projects out into the uh, speaker or out into the cup uh right. generally speaking those are not very good sounding in fact the first time i've heard a multiple driver uh headphone that sounded good was the enigma acoustics which sounded pretty good it still was odd in certain ways but mm -hmm. um, they pulled it off cool uh, Soaring Dancer is asking, at what price levels do you generally see a difference in headphone performance? So <laughs> it's a very difficult question and not one easily answered, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, I assume you're going to be able to generally expect better performance in a thousand dollar headphone than a hundred dollar headphone, but maybe not. Right. You would like to assume that. <laughs> However, yeah, but I'd be a there, fool to do so. Uh. Right, right. However, there was just a, a recently published scientific paper. In fact, it's it's somewhere two or three pages back on innerfidelity.com because I pointed towards it. Just a, was a quick blurb to point towards it because I thought it was so funny. But there was this research article that said there was absolutely zero correlation between price and acoustic performance and headphones. Wow. Zero, Zero correlation. That's amazing. Zero. Right. <laughs> uh, the, for example, those $60 headphones I just uh, reviewed the other day, the Sennheiser 471s, HD 471s, right. they are uh, as good as a number of 300, well, they're as good as some of the, oh, some of the thousand. I would almost take them over the Sony Z1, right? Because the Sony really? Z1, yeah, it's just fatally flawed in its frequency response. And it's a $3,000, I don't know. It's expensive headphone. I, I put it yeah, out yeah. of my mind because I, I I didn't like it so much. But wow, um, yeah. So it's all over the map. You you know, really all over the map. I mean, in some ways, that's why I listen to a lot of cheap headphones because there's almost no doubt you'll run across occasionally, you'll run across some that just sound great. And uh, the Noon Tech Zoro was like that. It's an on ear headphone, sixty nine bucks. I think it's even sixty nine bucks wireless. Mm. And um, it's an on-ear headphone, but it sounds great. So, uh, yeah. Wow. You, wow. I, okay. I, so virtually, virtually no correlation between price and performance. No. Yeah. No correlation. Amazing. So, Amazing. Yeah. Now, I, I, I think if they, well, I'm just going to leave it at that. It's a scientific okay. paper. They, that's what they said, not me. So, I, my, <laughs> yeah, right. My, You're just reporting it. <laughs> my, observa my observation is is that it's, it, it, there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Beatmaster is asking about, we were talking about AirPods earlier, and he was wondering about the AirPods compression chip. Do they have some sort of compression built in? I would think they would just use AAC on their stuff uh, and, and uh, uh, AppDex, right? Yeah, I would so, think so. But I'm wondering uh, about well, whether they, he's they have, that uh, new, they have that new they have that new M1 chip which is their new wireless uh chip. So I I mm -hmm. I am unaware of any compression that they do outside the uh, outside of what would be normal Bluetooth standards if you include AppDex and AAC because Right. Uh, right. I it. was wondering Beatmaster if you would clarify where, uh, what Tile what you're talking about is data compression and I'm right. wondering if he's not talking about dynamic compression. Yeah, I I don't or or both maybe, but I don't know. Or both maybe. So Beatmaster if you would clarify that that would be great. Meanwhile, JJ to the 4884 says are the 8323 still worth it? I don't know what you mean by 8323. Do you know, Tyler? That's it. Yeah, that's uh, mono price. Uh, ah, okay. All right. And uh, I would go at this point, I would go with my latest rec recommendation, the HD. Uh, 471. I heard the 8343 a long time ago, uh, mm. and I thought it was okay. 
for the at, at the price, but just okay. And I've seen that uh, uh, Bottlehead had a, a a version of it that you could modify, and and I tried it, and it didn't really sound any better to me. But um, so I I think the the new Sennheiser HD four seventy one is better sounding by quite a mm -hmm. bit, probably. Yeah. Beatmaster then asks another question. Uh, how did how has the how have wireless connections evolved, if at all, since the last time we spoke, last time you were on the show? Do you, do you spend much time thinking about wireless headphones or, or looking at them or listening to them? Well, there, yeah, uh, wireless headphones. This last year, for the first time, outsold wired headphones or some. And, and maybe no it was in, kidding. Yeah, maybe it was in some price category, but I think I, I I'm not sure what the limitation there was exactly, but I know that they it. it crossed cross streams you know um so right. yeah i i do have to spend a lot of time listening to wireless headphones to to try to review them um mm -hmm. i think wireless at this point um has gotten pretty darn good basically the background resolution of the current uh you um bluetooth 4.0 and uh is and is is good enough that it's not really the limiting factor. The limiting factor is more how much energy they put into the electronics of the headphones and how the acoustics of the headphones um, have been dealt with. Uh, a lot of folks just slapped electronics inside sort of existing designs early on, and, and that, of course, changed the acoustics of the headphones. So a lot of times the, the wireless version sounded quite a bit different than the wired version of a, of a model. And I'm find that to, finding that to be less so these days. Mm. Um, and and finding people are getting closer and closer to good performance on headphones. I think generally overall the headphone uh, world has actually had a trend towards better sound for the last maybe four or five years, four mm -hmm. years maybe. So um, it, it's uh, so the sound quality of the headphones really had to live up to. To, has to live up to the quality of the transmission over Bluetooth at this point, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't usually hear much difference on, on any particular model, a wired headphone or wireless headphone that you can use wired. Um, and uh, when, you, when you can do that, I'm, I assume you test them both. You try this way and that yeah. way. Yep, yep. Yeah, in fact, I measure them uh, both ways. And, and in fact, nowadays, it's, it's not surprising that I'll get a headphone that is uh and also noise canceling and then it's, so you can do noise canceling with on the wire and then you can do non-noise canceling bluetooth and then noise canceling bluetooth so that i end <laughs> up having to i end up having to measure a headphone four times maybe so um mm -hmm. that happens quite often and what i'm finding now is that the well the performance of the bluetooth is oh, oh, is getting better and better and better I'm also finding now that sometimes people can make headphones that sound the same wired or wireless. And, and that rarely happened previously. Mm, right. Uh, uh, but isn't Bluetooth, so, isn't Bluetooth always data compressed to some degree or is there now a uncompressed it is, uh, profile? It is, it is data compressed to some degree, but, uh, and mm. I, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's, but it's sort of like a, a high bit rate mp3 or uh high bit rate aac where it gets pretty darn close to cd mm -hmm. um performance well um as audio files you say oh it can't it really can't be very close to that if it's compressed at all compared to you know real high resolution and right. i would agree except i would add that with most headphones the fidelity is so far away from a, a really a high-end audio system that uh that it's just sort of a moot point. It, mm. That's the, the Bluetooth transmission is now not the pro it used to be, but it's not anymore. It, right. It, it's pretty darn close. So well, you know what? The bigger go ahead. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. I, I was no. going to say uh, it brings up a question that I had for you actually, uh, okay. which is I was thinking about uh, high res audio, and you know high res audio, right? I mean CDs oh. have a certain resolution to them they yep. have, they each yep. each sample is 16 bits and you take 44,100 samples per second and that's cd quality high res is generally defined roughly as something better than that 
And the question often comes up of, you know, how, how much better does it sound? Well, in my, my estimation, it depends on what you're listening on and the environment you're in. Uh, so if you have a, a, a room that isn't really super quiet, has a very low noise floor, you're not going to necessarily hear the advantage, even if your equipment can reproduce frequencies above 20K and a dynamic range beyond 96 dB. And I thought to myself, you know what? In a way, headphones might be the best way to listen to high-res audio because you've got some isolation, presuming you have over-ear headphones. Uh, you can certainly get above 20K and all the way down into the infrasonics, I'm sure. Uh, and they probably have a wider uh, dynamic range than most speaker-based systems. So am I correct that, that high-res audio is actually probably one of the best ways to hear it and listen to it is on headphones, good headphones? Yeah, good. Uh, uh, yeah, you might have to spend a lot of money to, to really be able to tell clearly the differences. Mm. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, you know, one thing to recognize that you don't have it out in a room, once you, once you send a single signal out and let's say it's a, a, a 16 kilohertz signal. Once you send that out from the speaker, it has to travel a, a lot, many wavelengths before it gets to your ears. Yep. And so, so, um, while you have reflections from the, the, the walls of your room, you don't have standing wave modes for those high frequencies mm. in speakers. You have standing right. wave modes for low frequencies because for low frequencies, that's yes. the dimension of your room. Well, this room is very small. <laughs> and so, oh, so you might, get, you might get high frequency standing waves in that tiny little room. You sure as heck do, and you even get standing waves in your ear canal that show up at various fairly well-known frequencies, oh, 9K, 5K. Very interesting. Uh, 13, uh, 16 K. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll, I'll add though that now there's psychoacoustic masking because your brain always hears your ear canal resonances because it's always there and it knows mm. how to ignore it for somehow. Uh, so, um, so high frequency response in headphones can be very problematic. You get a lot of times you get, uh, um, uh, acoustic uh, resonances at, at high frequencies, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all, all the way, all the way up, um, and that can be very problematic for getting good resolution on uh, high frequency resolution on headphones. Hmm. So it's that's a problem. Um, and I so maybe maybe my presumption isn't entirely correct, or it must be uh, met with some skepticism or caveats, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I think there may be some special cases like the Edemotic uh, ER4S, and then there's a couple of different versions of it. Um, that's a single driver balanced armature headphone, and they've they've gotten all the good they can get out of a single armature uh, headphone in that headphone. Now the bandwidth mm -hmm. is is somewhat limited uh, going up to those frequencies, but it has really really nice transient response, and and one of the things that um, supposedly is available at these higher resolutions that's not at the lower resolution is this time differences. So if one channel is a little sooner than the other, then you might be able to detect that on the headphones. You might be able to detect that even more than with speakers. Mm. So I don't know. I would say, I would say it's a mixed bag. You know, I, uh, everything's imperfect. Headphones are just imperfect compared to speakers in a different way. And, mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I, it's not that cut and dried. I, and I really have seen a lot of, uh, headphones that have significant problems as they reach the, you know, 20 K, uh, mm -hmm. marker. Um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm skeptical that headphones do a good job of reproducing high resolution audio as a result. Why do you, well, yeah, there you I go. You've, yeah. you've set me straight. I, <laughs> on really, on really, really good headphones and a good system that's all wired up, I can listen to some. And my experience typically is you listen to some music on in high res, and then you turn it off, and somehow it feels deader and less lifelike and something like that. It's not something that you can pick out in particular. In my mm. experience, it's more like it's more organic sounding for some reason. Mm. Clean, uh, clearer 
maybe. Uh, again, it's it's probably more of a subjective thing. It's not, oh, I can hear higher frequencies because, I mean, you and I both, we can't hear up to 20K. There's no way. No, no. <laughs> no but you uh, might be able to hear arrival time differences that are that short between the two mm, years. So. Mm, okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, I know that JJ to the, uh, 4884, he's asking a lot of questions here. Thank you, JJ. Um, oh, what are your thoughts about the, uh, death of the headphone jack? You know, Apple <laughs> iPhone set, the iPhone seven was, was famous for d dumping the headphone jack and using USB C, uh, in, I guess instead or wireless, preferably as far as Apple's concerned. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's the way of the world. I mean, I think eventually you're just not going to see very many wired headphones, and the ones that are, are going to be more enthusiast, hobbyist headphones and pro audio headphones and stuff like that. But for the the vast majority of consumers, now that they've gotten this the Bluetooth link, the link down very well and headphones are sounding fairly well and headphones are sounding better, mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there's an overriding reason to stick with wired headphones really for the mm. for the consumer um they're getting they're getting pretty good on the wireless side now uh the only exception i would make is you get on an airplane and then um you really can't be using bluetooth so you always have to have that backup really that well i thought you couldn't use wi-fi on a plane but i thought bluetooth uh, maybe, was okay maybe not uh i i if you put your phone in bluetooth in in airplane mode does it turn the bluetooth yeah. off I don't think so. It turns the Wi-Fi off for sure. Oh, that's a very well, good question. The somebody, new one for me. somebody there. I, I should, I should know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe somebody in the chat room will be able to tell us. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Beatmaster was talk is talking about the wireless W one chip question. I guess for the Apple, and right. and we have been talking about that. Yeah. Uh, some people on the net have mentioned uh, having a sensation of compression compared to the Beats version. I don't know. I would say, I would guess, now you're talking about AirPods versus the Beats, right? Correct, correct. All right. So I would guess once they put that W1 chip in there, that, that now they can have DSP for that headphone. And mm. remember how I said earbud headphones are just horrible. Right. Yep. Once you got DSP in there, you can probably play some games to make those headphones sound better. And um, as you said, the Apple AirPods are among the best earbuds available. Well, the the yeah, the AirPods before the AirPods were definitely uh, uh, one of the best that type. And my guess is the AirPods are even better because it's the same uh, shape and same acoustics. So they probably done now don't put some dsp on top of that and tr right tuned it even better yet so um in the process of doing that adding dsp and uh i don't know if maybe i wonder if they add a little bit of noise canceling in there too i, mm. I have to look it up i it's just a it's just a product that i've kind of got no interest in uh because it's so damn tough to really figure out what the hell they're doing. You know, they're, they're so secret about things and yeah. I don't, I don't really have the ability to test it very well. Although I, I might shortly be, be switching my test system around a little bit. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Listen Inc. Um, I don't know if you know those guys, they're, uh, a, an audio precision competitor. Uh, mm. listen Inc. Um, have contacted me and they're in the process of, um, refitting all my electronics. I'm keeping the same head and that'll keep the, the plots consistent to everything that I've been doing so far. Uh, but I'll be switching to a listen Inc. system and those systems have, uh, uh, USB connections, lightning connections, Bluetooth connections. So I can ah. test those modes easily. I test Bluetooth, but I, I, it's a, like a half. It only, it's only about half the measurements I normally do because, uh, for example, impulse response d doesn't work over the Bluetooth due to the latency and the audio precision I have can't deal with the latency of mm -hmm. the uh, MLSS signal that, that gets used to create the impulse response. So, right. um, uh, so once I get that, I'll have a little bit more opportunity to test Bluetooth headphones and I might, I might, uh, get my hands on the 
AirPods. But anyway, to go back to the pressure thing. Yes. So they may be doing some DSP. For, almost certainly they're doing some DSP to make it sound better. And it wouldn't surprise me if they've got, they dial in just a little bit of noise canceling. Even if it's not normal noise canceling, they may be able to do some stuff to um, get better bass response on that type of headphone. Those guys are mm -hmm. pretty smart. So pretty um, smart. So yeah. So and they now have Apple. Apple now has Tom Holman as as the head of their audio department. So oh. so they so they indeed um, uh, now some of the early noise canceling headphones people complained that they had a, a a sensation of pressure in their ears or mm. sometimes get, sometimes dizziness or uh, uh, vertigo feeling, um, and, and uh, it it may be that 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 they've not dialed it in right, and they get a little bit too much ultra low bass response or something. I don't know, mm -hmm. but but mm -hmm. it, it could be that um, I wouldn't it would it wouldn't be surprised that people get find some funny experiences with, the, with those headphones because my guess is is that they've done some very very interesting things inside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you get that new system, uh, you might be able to answer Terry Kay's question, which is, do Apple's AirPods provide sonic improvements compared to other Bluetooth wireless headphones in your tests? Well, you haven't really done those tests much no, I, yet. Uh, no, uh, no. And and I, I would say right off the top, no, because the AirPods, it's an intraconchal, it's an earbud. And it just, it's, you just, it, you're never going to, get really great sound out of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, the AirPod is really not going to sound great. The thing about the AirPods is they're convenient. They're really small, easy to put in your pocket, easy to put in the airline mm -hmm. pocket of the seat and, and walk also away. easy to lose. Exactly. That's what I was just saying. It's put it in the pocket <laughs> seat of the airplane and walk out and, oh, damn, yeah, there they yeah. go. Oh, man, I've lost the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. can't tell you how many uh, people called the room and said I lost my headphones on an airplane. Unbelievable yeah. numbers. Yep, yep. Yep. Uh, Eric Duckman is is mentioning some monoprice planar magnetic headphones for like a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. I got Have somebody, you look at sent those? One, somebody sent one in uh, to have me measure. Um, a lot of times interfidelity readers will send headphones in that aren't on the list. And I love it when they do that because it helps me get as many things as I can even beyond what I can think of. At any rate, uh, I got a, a set in the other day, uh, tried two different ear pads that he, he included in the package. And um, I, f I felt the Hi-Fi Man HE400S was better. Um, mm. And it's a little less expensive, I think, or about the same price. Um, but also, Mono Pro, um, Mass Drop recently uh, did a Mass Drop uh, a drop with uh, the Hi-Fi Man 400, they and and of course, what, as Mass Drop tends to do, there were some modifications to the actual normal product. So it's not an HD uh, HE 400s. It's it's something a little bit different, and it was great. And I think it was 169 bucks or something like that. So no, I don't. I, I found the mono price a little harsh and piercing sounding, and um, just just wasn't as good as the Hi-Fi Man. Um, similar Hi-Fi Man headphone. Mm -hmm. huh. iPad 31225 here does not share your opinion about the Hi-Fi Man HE400S. He, he didn't think it was very good. But I guess that's part of the game, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's part of the game. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Oh, I wanted to ask about, you were mentioning measurements, and I just wanted to make sure everybody understood the lengths you go to to measure headphones, which is pretty amazing. Uh, give us a brief overview of, of what, how, well, how that works. How do you measure headphones? Um, I could, I could probably, let's see. Oh, you're in your studio. Maybe you can show us. I'm, and I'm on a laptop. And so I should be able to, uh, although I got junk everywhere, but, um, <sighs> So this is where I measure my. This Look is my at that! Head. A little tiny anechoic chamber. Well, it's just to stop some reflections and damp it. It's not really an anechoic chamber. And then this is my head. This is a, <laughs> Your second head. Yeah, this is my valuable head. 
the one that actually <laughs> is worth something. Uh, and and on the the uh, on the lines of worth something, this is a thirty five thousand dollar piece of gear here. Oh so, man. Yeah, and uh, let's see. I could. Uh, so basically, it's, it's kind of a rough, rough approximation of the shape of a head. With it's a rough some, approximation of the shape of a head, but it's a very, very specific uh, um, ear shape. So this mm. is a, a a mathematical model, a geometric model that the IEC is is now adopted as a standard. So this is a standard shaped human ear. And um, it was it's the result of many, many, many hundreds of measurements of regular ears. Um, all of were, which are different, by the way. Yep, they're all different. Um, there are some um, uh, racial uh, commonalities. So certain certain races have uh, certain characteristic ear shapes that are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. At any rate, this is a – so I'll, basically what I do is I put the headphones on the ears and put them in the chamber. And um, a, a lot of times I have to spend a lot of time – getting it to be just right. Now, I actually do this inside the chamber typically. but You're doing you it here it so we can see it. Yeah, it, normally I do that inside the chamber. Then I don't have to move the head and it won't shake. And then mm -hmm. while I do that, I look on an oscilloscope that's up there. Um, and I, I look at a 30 hertz square wave so I can see the base response. And I can tell whether I'm getting a good seal or not. And then I measure mm -hmm. them five times. A little bit forward, a little bit back, a little bit up. Oh, interesting. Down and then centered as best I can. And the reason for doing that is you get some spatial averaging. Remember how we talked about the resonances at high frequencies that you right. get mm -hmm. a lot of times with headphones. So those resonances um, will change as you move the headphones around and then we'll average out uh, at, um, at the end when we do the actual measurement. And then here um, is my Audio Precision System 2 Cascade. Back in the day, is a twenty-two thousand dollar piece of gear or whatever it is, and um, that's what Listen now, Inc. is going to be changing for me. Going to be replaced, yeah. Now, inside that head, inside those ears, are probably little, very high quality microphones, right? That pick up what the headphones are are pumping into the ears, right? Yeah, actually, more than that. I mean, it's first of all, it's a very special ear canal. It has um, some volumes in it that. Uh, um, mimic the acoustic impedance of the ear canal. So it acts like mm. a human ear canal. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, it also has the, the diaphragm of the microphone that's in there has the same acoustic impedance as the eardrum so that uh, it acts like an eardrum. So it's not only uh, uh, it's a high quality microphone, but it's a very special high quality microphone in that it's designed to act like an eardrum and to have the acoustic impedance and compliance and damping huh. of an eardrum. Yeah, wow. so it's, yeah, it's a quite a, a complicated thing. And, and here's the worst part: uh, there are about five or six manufacturers of these acoustic heads in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you line them up all next to each other and measure the same headphones, you get different measurements. Oh, man. So, <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. So you really can't compare measurements on one head against measurements on the other head, even though they supposedly meet this international standard. Yeah. Um, and then that's why there's an advantage. Uh, uh, and one of the reasons why I do this and why I put the energy into it is because there is no other place. I have about a Getting, I, I would say there's probably 800 uh, on uh, uh, measurements of headphones, 800 head, headphones measured on the Interfidelity website. And there, if you drop down the resources and and then click on the headphone measurements, you'll go right to the page of all these PDFs, and uh, uh, and they you can compare them one against the other because they're all taken with the same head. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I have that nobody else has really is you know, a lot of measurements done with exactly the same head. And that's a, mm. that's kind of a big deal because they can be in the same operator because the operator right. can, it's amazing how, you know, there's a lot of art to moving those headphones and getting to seal and knowing when they're sealing and knowing when they're not, you know, and <laughs> right. Right. It's a, 
It's a tricky well, thing. But this, also, this also means, though, that you can't necessarily compare the measurements that you get with the measurements that some other headphone website would get if they're using a different a different head. They they wouldn't right. be apples to apples. That's correct. Um, I would say that they're close. I mean, it is a standard, and they do cost thirty five hundred thirty five thousand dollars. <laughs> okay, so they be <laughs> yeah close, right? But they're not exact. Um, uh, and, and in fact, uh, GRAS, I believe, uh, yeah, GRAS, um, mm. this last year came out with a completely new uh, head in, in that it has a more uh, anatomically, co anatomically correct ear canal. The ear canal in my head, once it gets to the entrance of the ear canal in the ear, it's perfectly round. And mm. theirs actually has the bend in it uh, that a normal ear canal would have, and it's a little bit oval shaped like a normal ear canal would be. So mm -hmm. they're they're making some changes uh, with that. So mm -hmm. and and then I'll add on top of that, um, I could put out about one review a week of headphones. And the reason why, I mean, I'd like to be able to put out two reviews a week of headphones, but that would mean that every headphone came, that came in my shop would be worth reviewing, which they're not. Remember that <laughs> we talked about. It. Price, well, this is a re before. this is a reviewer's uh, c conundrum. Is there are, uh, of anything really? I have the same problem. There are so many products out there. Uh, which ones do you review? And my right. philosophy is generally, I'm going to try to, for the most part, review products that are that are going to be good because right. then I can say, yeah, this is a good one. Occasionally, there'll be a product that it, everyone's anticipating. Oh, I can't wait till this comes out, and it comes right. out, and it's a dog. You know, right. And OK, you've, you've got to say that because it's That's been so widely anticipated. Right. Right. I I uh, well, for me, what happens is I get maybe five or six headphones a week in. So I have to measure five, six headphones a week. And mm. each headphone takes about about an hour to measure roughly. Um, uh, you go through an automated process, right? With you put the headphones on, you do it five times. Right. And then and once I do it five times, uh, it does frequency response five times. Once I do it five times, then I put it in the central position and then it measures frequency response. But then it also goes and measures square wave response and distortion and impulse mm -hmm. response and isolation and all those other things. So mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, so I got five or six hours of work uh, at best. But remember, I said a moment ago that I now get headphones in that I got to measure four times. Yeah. So now you got, you got a half a day on one pair of headphones. Uh. Um, and then there's the, you turn the system on and you've made a mistake with cables in the wrong place or, Oh, I, right. you know, and there's always something that comes up. Oops. You know? Uh, mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is, is that it, it, there's probably a solid day and a half, I mean, then you then you have to count in m many of the headphones I have to send back. So now you got to box them up and send them back and stuff like that. It ends right. up being a big a, a big time sink measuring these headphones, but it does allow me to find good headphones quickly because, you know, you can tell by the measurements whether they're good or bad. You, know, mm -hmm. you can't tell how good or you can't tell how bad. Well, sometimes you can tell how bad, but you can't. <laughs> but you can get some indication, and that yeah, leads can, to the. That leads to the question of how much core, we talked before about the correlation between price and performance. How tight is the correlation between measurement and performance or subjective impression? Well, it's great that this show is being recorded because I'm going to write an article for Monday. And, and, <laughs> it, and the article is about exactly that. Mm. And um, here's what I think. I think neutral is gross. And what I mean by that is, uh, especially with headphones, we don't know what neutral is. Okay, yet. Well, wouldn't We're, wouldn't that be wouldn't that be a flat frequency response? No, because on once it goes into your ear canal and into your eardrum, there's all sorts of things. It's no that longer modify flat. It's, right, it's no longer flat. Uh, it's got a, a peak at three k, and it's got some other features of you know how how high it rises up to that peak at three k, and how fast and where it starts. Mm. Um, there's some, uh, stuff like, uh, 
in a room, you normally get some increase in base response. And so what, what, what Harmon International thinks is that there should be a bump in the base response that you naturally get with a room. You don't have to dial it in there in a room. You get this base bump in, in the room to the boundary effects. Yeah. But, but in headphones, you, it's not there. So mm. um, they, they prescribe adding in about 3 dB of increase in bass below 150 hertz or so. So, mm. um, so a, a flat headphone is not flat. The thing is we don't know exactly where that is. So mm. there's, a, there's a neutral, and even the technical people don't know where the neutral is. And, and, <laughs> and that's, that's apart from the circle of confusion issue of it was mastered and recorded in a room that sounds like this. And then, you know, it comes to you and your system sounds different and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So that's a whole mm -hmm. other, you know, ball of wax. But, mm -hmm. but the, so I think what happens is this. When I, I think neutral is a, a relatively wide band, maybe 3 dB. Let's just pick arbitrarily pick 3 dB plus or minus so 3 the, dB. The frequency so response I, is within plus or minus 3 dB of some nominal value. Some, right. Some unknown neutral that we don't know exactly yeah. where it is, but we know roughly where it is. So if you right. get if you get within 3 dB of that all the way across and you're not doing wiggles and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, then what happens? So if it's outside that, you get a headphone that's outside that, and and all it, you put it on, you turn the music on, and you go, oh my goodness, this thing's a bass monster, or oh my goodness, this thing is screeching in my ears, or oh my goodness, this thing is rolled off on on top, or mm. <clears throat> the 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 overwhelming impression, the 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 the, uh, the uh, qualia of the headphone, to use that term, qualia, yeah, qualia, uh, the qualia of the headphone is is, is a direct directly represented by the the measurement uh by the measurements because the measurements are going to show you oh my goodness it's got 15 db as a base or something like that right so so uh until you get to neutral uh your perception is generally speaking going to be about what are the flaws what are these things that are far away from neutral those are going to be mm. what characterizes the headphone then i think once you get within neutral once you get close within this sort of gross measurement um then what happens is it's harder to identify the particular character flaws whether it's a little bit as sizzle at 7k or maybe a little bit too much bass response or there's a phase delay in the bass that causes it to sound a little soft and not tight you know loose sounding um so uh those small errors don't grab your attention what they do though is they add up to some thing which when perceived your brain projects a character on them oh this is a sweet sounding headphone this is a a little lean sounding headphone or this is a wet headphone or a liquid headphone or a coherent headphone i mean people are going to put all sorts of words on it but the bottom line is is that you have this overall grokking of the headphone uh at and and it's a, a, a comprehensive whole and you sense uh, how easy is it to hear the whole of the music? You know, how easy is it to um, get wrapped up in the music, um, mm. to, to be enveloped? How, e with it? how easy is it to distinguish individual instruments, maybe, or something like that? Um, well, then it gets it starts getting particular. Although some of those things, I don't know that we measure the right things to to look at yet. Ah, but, but, but the bottom line is is that is that if you get hit three headphones, and this is what happened to me, I did this review on these $60 headphones from Sennheiser, and compared to, to two other relatively low cost uh, headphones, looked at mm. the measurements and thought, okay, this is what I might hear when I listen to these. But then I, I go do the listening, and um, it, it just sounded, uh, uh, the, there was a different relationship. For example, the Sennheiser HD569, which is a $179 sealed headphone, it was more erroneous in its tonal response. It was a little farther away from neutral than this lower cost headphone was. Huh. But, but somehow it sounded more liquid. It sounded you could hear the whole of the music better. You could, you know, you could sort of take it all in at once 
much more easily. Um, mm. And I don't know what I couldn't see anything in the measurements that would lead me to understand why that one had that character while the uh, 471 sounded a little boring to me. Mm. Uh, and the uh, uh, Audio Technica ATH M50X sounded a little kind of edgy and har- har- harsh ish. And, mm-hmm. and it didn't really, the measurements were relatively similar enough to where you go, it, boy, my attention is more on that. So I think the, the, what happens is, is that when you're outside of neutral, you're just hearing flaws and you just can't get past it. You know, this thing's got 15 dB of extra bass. How am I supposed to tell you what the mid range sounds like? <laughs> when the bass is just masking it completely. Yeah. Compared to, compared to what, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so outside you hear the flaws once you start getting close, then you start, uh, you, you start, uh, participating your, your consciousness starts participating with the sound and your, your overall impression is not about these sort of objective flaws, but the subjective summation of what you're hearing. And, mm-hmm. and that can be hard to describe. So, well, that's, that's why we wordsmiths work so hard at describing it. <laughs> Yeah. You know? What was the question? What was the question again? Oh, the measurements <laughs> how the measurements relate. Yeah. I hear yeah the how the measurements relate to, to, to what your subjective impression is. I mean, you've I, spent now many years and you've c- compiled 800 measurements for 800 headphones. Right. So you, you must have developed some sense of when you see measurements that look like this, the headphones going to sound like that. You bet. Um, I can certainly, even the headphones that are close, I can certainly look at the measurements to go, you know, this present region is a little low. And I bet if I listen carefully, I'll be able to hear that. Mm. I'm biased essentially by my measurements. Although I always listen to headphones before I measure them. I don't review Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I always listen to them to try to see what I hear. And then I kind of take a guess at what the measurements are going to look like. Ah. Uh, But I always have the... I always do my analysis with the measurements available to me. So it is available as a bias, so to speak. Right. Um, and, and what, what I, what I do is compare what I hear to what the measurements tell me I ought to hear. I, I really don't, I don't think I let them bias me very much because I think it's a fun game to look at the measurements and go, well, the presence is a little low here. But I actually don't hear that very much. I would have mm. thought I would have heard it more. But it may be because it's a little bit higher at 4K, which making up for it or you know something like that. Again, right. this is where once you get close enough to neutral, then you start filling your you start you know subjectively filling in the blanks. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's a very different thing. So I would say that I can tell a lot by the headphone measurements. I, I can yeah. I can pretty finely tell yeah this is a you know i can tell the difference between gradations and headphones and i can pretty much tell which headphone i'll like even if they're close to neutral but i won't be able to tell what my you know cognitive qualia is you know what Mm -hmm. what that what the experience is going to feel like whether Mm -hmm. they sound boring or whether they just sound neutral or whether mm-hmm. they sound, you know, liquid or mm-hmm. bounce. Bouncy is a word. I, there's this thing that I hear sometimes that <laughs> I, I, I can only characterize it as bouncy. Um, and I don't know where it comes from, but, but they, they make mm-hmm. you tap your feet and make you bounce. And yeah. So okay. All right. It's so interesting. I'm thinking... that is. Sorry, go ahead. And I don't know what the measurement for that is. Yeah. <laughs> what is the bounciness quotient? <laughs> Right. The BQ. Right. <laughs> uh, I, it makes me think about my own work as a TV reviewer. And I I go the exact opposite way, sort of because I have to. I do the measurements first while I'm calibrating the TV because right. I can't really evaluate. Well, I can evaluate the TV without calibrating it, but I want to calibrate it so that all the TVs I look at are on the same playing field, so to speak. Right. Right. So in the process of calibrating a TV, you get a set of measurements. You can't help it. It's what you get. And so I I see those before I really start looking seriously at the TV and and being critical of it and saying, well, you know, the black level, the blacks or the shadow detail is kind of not so great or it's really great or whatever, you know. 
Um, so I find that very interesting that, that we kind of have to, I have to take that approach. I have to look at the measurements before I actually seriously look at TVs, unless I have somebody else do the cal calibration and then say, don't show me the measurements. Right. I, I would, I, I, well, first of all, I would say that I, I don't seriously listen to the headphones without the measurements. I have a listen. Mm -hmm. I mean, now I yeah. listen to so many headphones. I have a listen and I take a, f a few notes and then I go, okay, I do the measurements. So, um, so I don't, I don't spend a lot of time with the headphones until I measure them. And, um, do you find yourself uh, influenced by the measurements? Do you find yourself saying, I'm surprised by the measurements sometimes? Yes, I do. I do, yeah. actually. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I go, wow, this the, the black level didn't measure very good, but it really looks quite good. Right. Uh, for example, or something like that. And we find right. that with speakers, too. You know, the, they yeah. might might measure really poorly, and yet some reviewer might say, you know, they measured really poorly, but man, they sounded good in my room. And that's part of the problem. Yeah, so that's speaker. A, yeah, that's, that's a, a whole different problem. kettle of fish is, you know, speaker reviews depend so much on the room in which they're reviewed. And it may very well have no relationship at all to the room that you're going to put them in, that, that the buyer right. is going to put them in. Headphones right. are a little better in that respect, aren't they? Because oh, a lot, yes, yeah. You know, everybody's ear is different. And in fact, in the chat room, there are a lot of people talking about, what do you mean an average ear? Uh, you know, what does that mean? Well, it's a very carefully calculated shape that kind of represents the average of all these different ears. Um, I, I, and, I'll tell you a funny thing. I tell you a funny thing about that. Oh, it, um, I've a, a few times run into research departments where they uh, were working on um, generalizing the ear shape to have a headphone go into the ear, right? So they're, they want one shape that fits into all these ears. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they go, but do a bunch of research of what shapes of the ears, blah, blah, blah. And they almost always come out with six shapes. And, and I didn't notice it at first because the first company said, oh, we have six shapes that we fit into. And then, and then I see it like two or three more times at other places yeah here's the six shapes we fit into so my guess is there's about six general shapes that ears are uh mm. probably racial uh things you know that might might have something part of part of the influence of it would be a, a sure. racial thing or sure. genetics anyway but there are like yeah. as you say six sort of generic general types right. of shapes and then within those there are infinite variations yeah it's all over the place and i i would say uh, so the, one of the questions is, do head, headphones sound different because your ears are shaped different? And, and so one person can have one impression and another person can have another impression. Exactly. And both yeah. impressions are valid. Okay. Right. So I would say yes and no. Okay. For one, we are so used to our own ear shape that we, a lot of it, we just back out. It's, it's, uh, perceptually masked. So, so to some extent, the shapes of our ears are, are zeroed out for our own head. Right. On the other hand, a headphone is a very uh, unnatural acoustic environment for your ear. And it does interact with the shape of your ear. And, uh, for example, uh, AKG has this uh, um, N90Q, which is the Quincy Jones. It's like a... $1,500 noise canceling, uh, full size headphone. And one of the things that they did in there, they wrote some research papers on it is, is they have a microphone in there. They can put out some sounds. They actually, while you're wearing it, you can push a button and you hear it go beep, boop, boop, or whatever. I can't remember what the sound is right now, but it makes right. a, 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 some test sort tones. of sound, a test tone. Right. And it will actually within your uh, uh, it, it measures the sound not going into your ear. It measures the sound around the ear somewhere. At, I think they have two or three microphones. They measure the, the sound in the cup in a couple of different places to get rid of the effects of the pinna being in the ear. So they, they wow. get the ear in there. They probably have some generalized cases where if the ear is small, you have more of this modal resonance. If the ear is big, you have more of this modal. If the ear is forward on the head, you get more of this modal. So they, they probably have a map that they, they, they work from. But it actually puts out a test zone with the ear in there, and you push a button to compensate. And I'll be darned if it wasn't 
fairly obvious. Because what I would do is I'd take the headphones and put them on my leg, and I'd push the calibrate button. So there's no <laughs> ear. There was no, no pin in there, there to begin with. Yeah, right. Right. So I figured, okay, this has got to be an extreme case, right? So, And then right. I put the headphones on and listened to it with it calibrated to my leg. And then I'd push the button to listen to it with my ear. And and I'll be darned if it, if it didn't make it less harsh sounding. Every time I did it, I tried a couple of different things. I put it on my head and then put it on my ears. And then I, I, I put it on my ears and calibrated it and put it on the head and measured it uncalibrated and then – and then recalibrated it and measured it, and and sure enough, there they they it cleaned up the signal some. So mm. I'm so, amazed actually because the your your brain is so used to the sound coming into your ear, which is influenced by the pinna, the outer ear, uh, mm -hmm. that if you were to take that influence away, I would think it would sound really weird. Again, it really doesn't take it away. What it does is it it tries to even out the sound field around the ear. So the measurement they take is trying to even out the sound field around the ear, and then they just let the ear do its yeah. thing. And, and I, right. it worked. Amazing. 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 Well, listen, we, <laughs> we, on that note, uh, we're going to have to say thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's been a fascinating hour, and it uh, went by, as always, way too fast. <laughs> way too fast. Nice to be here, yeah. Scott. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. That's Tyle Hertzens. He is the editor-in-chief at innerfidelity.com. Uh, anything you ever wanted to know about headphones, that's the first place I send people, innerfidelity.com. So be sure to go there and check out uh, all the great stuff that uh, Tyle has on there. You can find me at avsforum.com, and you can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at avsforum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, I will be joined by a panel of journalists uh, with who, with me, will have attended the Cedia Trade Show, which will be in San Diego this year. After we get back, we'll convene right here at our normal time to talk about what we saw and heard at the show. So that should be very interesting, and I do hope you will join us. Until then, geek out.